Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Matt Thomas here from the Altitude Group at Compass. Um, I am here with Chad Miller, and Chad is an inspector that I work with from Horizon Home Inspections. And I've been working with Chad for, I don't know, close to a decade, maybe? Sounds Sound about right. right. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Chad, um, welcome, first of all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. I appreciate this. Yeah. So, Chad, I, what I'm trying to do here is to get have people get to know you. Uh, we're providing a home educational series that even after people buy their homes, um, that they can kind of refer to this series, you know, and to kind of make sure that they remain educated about being a homeowner. Um, and, and, you know, I thought of you right away because, you know, you uh, obviously, you know, kind of home maintenance is your game. Now you inspect homes, um, you know, for buyers. And so I recommend folks go to you to have their home inspected as they're looking to buy their home. But obviously then they become homeowners and then they've got this whole responsibility of uh, owning the home and taking care of it. So I thought it'd be great to have you on. So Chad, will you tell us a little bit about uh, like your background and your expertise? Yeah, sure. So um, the background of, of me and how I got to where I'm at in this business today, it kind of all started from a home inspection that I had 22 years ago on a house that I was selling. And um, it was an interesting, you know, example of where there were gaps in this industry that I felt like we could improve. And the uh, the home inspector did an inspection on a house I was selling. He went home and did a handwritten report, which I couldn't really read. And he got my house mm -hmm. mixed up with somebody else's. And ultimately that, yeah, it cost me the sale of my house. And that was during a time when, you know, you didn't get many offers. So it was pretty frustrating and a little devastating at that point, but we got through it. And I just said, there's got to be a better way to do this. There's got to be more information, more accountability and more education on, on in, in, in during a home inspection. So I, essentially kind of quit my job and started working, uh, delivering pizzas and started doing this business. And everything I did from that point forward was um, pictures and, and it was a description, basically typing it in on a Palm Pilot, if anyone remembers those. Um, and then I would synchronize it over to the computer. So two things were happening there that didn't happen on the inspection report. Um, one of them was you didn't have to worry about reading my handwriting. It was all typed in and my handwriting is horrible. So that helped everyone. And also there are pictures to kind of help explain what was happening. So one of the first folks in, in companies in Colorado to start doing that, which was very helpful for my business, but also helpful for people to get that visual. So that's how it started. And, and kind of my background from there was I went through, got certified, did all the training things. I actually trained with another inspector for about eight months and nine months before I started doing my own. And I was with him seven days a week, really kind of making sure I did the best I could to gain that knowledge. Now, Prior to that, my dad was one well, of the kind of was guy was you could call him a flipper, but we lived in those houses. And I joke with people and I say, you know, I lived in houses and I learned how to do things wrong. So at, over time, I figured out how to do it right. Um, there's a lot of things you can learn from dad. That, there's a lot of good things you can learn from dad. I, there's a few things that I picked up on that I said, I don't want to do it this way. So yeah, right. That. And, and we learn, you know, you kind of learn what's behind the walls and how things can be maybe shortcut or things that can be done right. So that's that's how we got started. And and, you know, I my hope is, is that even today, 22, 21 years later doing this business, that the people really are getting an education, not just what is wrong. Yeah, well, that's awesome. And that's part of the reason I like working with you is, um, you know, there's an educational piece to it, um, you know, um, a lot of times inspectors can be known for causing alarm. Now, obviously anyone wants to know, should this, should I buy this house? Should I not buy this house? But the last thing we want is to have someone who is, I would consider an alarmist who scares you so much, especially uh, the wrong type of person who's, who maybe needs to be educated, but definitely won't react well to being scared. And then the next thing they know is they're actually missing out on an opportunity to move forward with the home. Um, because really when, when you introduce people to the things that may be wrong in a home, it just starts a negotiation process. It doesn't mean that a homeowner has to take on all those things, for instance, but at least you're aware. And, um, so, and it's very cool that, uh, that, you know, you were one of the first to start with the, uh, you know, typing up, you know, your inspections and, and, uh, providing photos. And, and I can't really honestly imagine, um, what it would be like to not have those things. Um, so that's just the kind of report I'm used to is just to have a, you know, a, a typed out and, uh, you know, descriptions and, under, you know, have an understanding, but, you know, obviously photos are worth a thousand words. So, yeah, uh, that's exactly. really cool. 
very it's a lot easier for people to see and understand and and versus just reading you know something it's a checkbox was it satisfactory or not you know a little more detail is helpful yeah for sure um you mentioned uh you know getting certified what kind of certifications are available and, and like how is that important what, what does that teach you well yeah give us a little bit of background on that. there's there's a few certifications that are out there and, and we've belonged to a couple certifying bodies over the years we've landed on internachi which is the international association of home inspectors and 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 i think for in all honesty it's a good thing to have because people like to hear that you're certified piece and that you've got some education behind what you have not just you know working knowledge so we do that but yeah. um at the end of it all uh, i do like people to kind of understand that there's a very very um, important piece of the home inspection that needs to happen and that is communication the, the be able to hear and see and be able to ask questions and have someone that can communicate with you in a way you understand versus using vernacular or industry standard knowledge or words that can be confusing. So one of the things that we like to do is use that training and knowledge to say, okay, we know what that means. We understand the background behind it, but how do we translate that to someone who may not have an idea what a GFCI is, you know, something yep. like that. No, that's, that's actually great as well. I mean, it, you know, you need to be able to speak kind of in layman's terms because, um, you know, ultimately, and, and I, you know, I've learned the same thing. There's a lot of vernacular that real estate agents use. We talk a lot about it, you know, things on a technical level and then, you know, that doesn't necessarily translate, you know, it's like, hey, help me make, help me make sense of this. Does it make sense to buy this house, move forward on this, or does it not? Um, you know, and, and you're right. So, um, and a lot of times you're dealing with first-time first, first homebuyers, um, you know, that uh, maybe have not been introduced to any of the vernacular that you might use, or just um, any of the, you know, quite honestly, the inner workings of a home. So, Chad, let's, let's talk a little bit about the home inspection. Um, you know, you probably see all kinds of things, and obviously, I've had you inspect homes from the 1890s yeah. um, all the way to brand new homes. Um, and I think, you know, people ask me all the time, uh, you know, does it even make sense to inspect a brand new home? And are brand new homes perfect? Uh, no, Matt. Yeah, you, you'd <laughs> wish they were, but they're not. And and that's they're just not. because you've got people and, you know, multiple hands, you know, digging into this home and putting it together. And, and so we do new build home inspections all the time and the biggest reason why i would tell somebody to do a new build is because with workmanship and people working in homes things can be get missed things can get damaged and sometimes you know the city guys or the the, the code inspectors are way busy they're they're over you know worked and they they may not be able to go through a house in detail like we do they'll take a sample number of things in a home just because of time and and they're they're limited so we kind of go through and give the house what i call a physical top to bottom and look at everything where uh, a you know new build typically it's a cursory view something that isn't nearly as in depth and you know kind of even to speak about back to your point on property uh, disclosures we call that kind of flying over the Rocky Mountains in an airplane. It's a nice view. Things look pretty. Um, you like the, the mountains. You like the trees and the snow. But our job is to get down into the forest. Let's get down there and let's walk around on the trail and see what's really going on. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's interesting. Um, I have had you do several um, pre-drywall inspections. And that's basically when somebody's building a new home and, and um, you know, they're, it's before the drywall goes up, quite honestly. And so... What's interesting is we shot a video about that several years ago, yeah. and it's actually my number one performing um, uh, video that we've ever done because nobody's nobody does them. I certainly nobody's shot too many videos on these things, um, but ultimately I don't think people are aware that even during the brand new home buying process, um, there are th still things to inspect. And kind of like what you alluded to, there's other inspections. The builder's going to say, "Hey, the city's going to take a look at it." Or they're taking a look at it. They're checking boxes and making th sure things are okay. Why do you need an inspector? And you know, it, it's kind of to, to your point. You know, there's we need to look at the details, make sure nothing's been missed, and also, it's representation on on the buyer side, right? The, the builders doing what they're doing, trying to get away with what they can get away with. Not that they're uh, doing anything, you know, nefariously, but they're trying to get a home out the door that meets a certain level of requirement. But they may still be missing things, and so yeah. you know, when you've got you on on their side you're advocating for them to 
you know, to be able to find the right things um, that they should be aware of before the house gets buttoned up and drywall put on and such. Yeah, that's that's uh, we I kind of look at that as that's the best place to kind of again back to the physical um, type thing. That's that's the best time to look at the veins and look at all the nerve endings and on the skeleton and kind of go through and make sure that that the basis and the inter inner workings of this home are set up to be successful. And that that's the best time to do the X-ray. Very good. Chad, what are the, some of the things that uh, I know you've seen it all. So what I was starting to say before is you, you, we've looked at homes from the 1800s. We looked at homes from the 2020s. And um, what what are the things that you, gosh, I don't know, are there any major things that you see that people commonly overlook? Or... Well, I think in this is it, it almost becomes sometimes comical between me and, you know, realtors that we work with a lot. The, the biggest thing that, that we ever kind of talk about is Grading, right? Property grading, yeah. And and new new build homes, you know, most of the time they're they're pretty good. But we talk about the how that construction process happens and why grading is important. Maybe not today, but down the road, so that they can protect. But explain explain what grading is too. Yeah. I think probably even some good. Like, so when it? when you look at a home, you've got a your home should look like it's sitting on a on a hill for the most part. And so we want that earth to be nice and solid. And when water comes down the side of the house, that it moves away and nothing is coming towards the foundation. It's key. Uh, to do that because we do have expansive soils in Colorado and and my experience tells me that a little bit of water causes some heaving a lot of water causes sinking so the point is let's just keep the water away so um, grading is always one that we speak about uh, you know it's something that is a constant ongoing process it's it's actually it settles over time because that area of dirt that's right next to your house hasn't really been compacted it's actually been excavated so mother nature slowly levels that goes negative and our job as a homeowner is let's get it back up there let's keep it moving away and so that's one way that that you know grading become an issue another way is that people put in landscaping and they put in retaining walls and they negate that grade so now we're headed back towards the house again or they put up this flat area and put a retaining wall which is kind of like a dam so grading is probably one that we see most often in a house well and you, you and i are on the same page on this for another reason i um i've been in the business now in real estate for 13 years prior to that i was a, a geologist so i studied soil and that kind of thing and understand what kind of uh, how soil can be the type of soils that we have around colorado can be very very damaging especially when water is introduced yeah. um, because of the expansive nature of it uh and then before that i actually growing up my dad built concrete foundations so mm. um all that kind of stuff absolutely makes sense um the fact that you uh you know uh, kind of uh, uh, let people know that that's something to be very cautious and uh, aware of is is um to me is right in line with with some of the bigger problems that we have in Colorado. When people think about, you know, problems in, in the in the Colorado area, Denver Front Range area, you don't think necessarily of water because it's not it's a dry climate here, right? But water can be super um, damaging because of our expansive soils. Right. Um, and so that's 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 a great one. And um, I think you've you know, you've said, you know, I mean, if you can get water five feet away from the house, there's very little problems that you're ever going to have with, with water in general. Yeah, that, right after that, that five foot rule really kind of gives you, we talk about that excavated piece. So let's just give an example. You've got a concrete wall, they dig all the way down and they dig out about five feet. They pour the foundation and then we add dirt back. So you've got three to four feet of dirt still there that's been excavated. So if we can get that water past that five foot mark, we're back on the hard ground, never been excavated. The hope is, is that it runs away and not soak into the ground. So you're right. If you kind of look at a new build um, where somebody hasn't you know, messed with the gutters or the downspouts and the extensions, normally those extensions are about five feet long. So that's out past that area where it's been excavated. So often grading is actually really easy to fix. Mm -hmm. It's it's laborious, right? But it's not necessarily technically difficult. Right. In a lot of cases, even when the builder comes in and puts in, um, you know, weed fabric and then puts some landscaping rocks or something like that, if that stuff, you know, settles, um, even though it's, you know, you've got to get a shovel, you're going to get some sweat and some dirt on you. Um, you know, you got to pull all that stuff back. You just put in, put in more soil, compact it in a way that it slopes away from the house. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then put everything back. So yeah, I call that's that not just technical. just the working into the shovel. It's got to just got to do it. Yep, exactly. Well, that's uh, I appreciate you bringing that up, Chad. What are um, some of the other pitfalls that you 
run into that uh, you think homeowners should be aware of? You know, I think um, probably the next the next thing, and this again kind of doesn't necessarily relate to a new build home. I think we've talked a little bit about why it's important for us to do that, but you know, maintaining their utilities or their their you know furnace, hot water tank, their AC unit. Again, we try to our best to go back and and talk about education, not about what's wrong. Like, what do I need to do to make sure that my furnace is running and in peak performance? And how soon should I be looking at getting someone out to clean it? And what signs do you look for? I always tell people that one of the biggest things they can do when they move into their home is to kind of pay attention to not just what they see, but what they hear. You know, it's funny. And people we do this now as home inspectors. If somebody's in the house and I hear water running somewhere else, I, I start thinking like, whoa, where is it coming from? Why is that happening? Um, or if the furnace kicks on while I'm upstairs and I hear a weird pitchy noise, then I kind of make a note of that. But the homeowners need to do the same thing. Your house is a living, breathing, almost moving organism. And we got if we listen to it, it'll tell us some things before it gets bad. Oh, very good. There's... Um... Uh, there's a lot of, you know, when it comes to things like furnace and AC and those kinds of things, people, I think people kind of lose sight of the fact that, you know, there's maintenance involved, but that maintenance is like getting your oil changed. People can have cars and engines that run for a very long time if they're careful about their maintenance. The same will happen with a furnace in a lot of cases, uh, because all they need to do is be cleaned and, and just checked out and take, taken a look at every once in a while to give them long life before they start to fail. But one that's neglected doesn't tend to last very long, especially much past the warranty yeah. lifespan. If, you're, if your furnace is dirty, there's a few things that's going to happen. You're going to be basically taking dust and pushing it into the system, and it'll burn it and stick, kind of like clogged arteries will start to happen. Um, the blowers will get out of wobble. Hot water tanks are another thing in Colorado that we need to kind of make sure we maintenance up and take care of. There's, and it's really fairly easy. Uh, every hot water tank has a little hose spigot at the bottom of it. And if you hook a hose to it and open it up for 60 seconds once a year, you're pulling all the sediment that we have in our water off the bottom of that tank and it lasts longer. Um, I don't know if you've ever taken a hot water tank out before, but they're heavier than when they were put in because <laughs> there's mud in the bottom. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have not. Uh, plumbing and electrical are two things I don't do in yeah, my own yeah. house. There's okay. no way. Yeah. Yeah. So hot water tanks um, can be yeah. maintenance as well, just to make them last longer. Their average lifespan is about 12 to 15, but I can tell you that there are people that understand maintenance and they last longer if they just, you just got to pay attention. Awesome. Um, let's talk about um, sewer scopes. Okay. Uh, you know, when are they necessary and is it is it necessary even in a, in a new home? Yeah. So I would say that very rarely would you put it in the not necessary bucket. And though the, that example might be a condominium, something where you're several floors off the ground, um, you may not want to do one for the simple fact is, is a, a sewer camera can't make it from a second or third floor all the way out to where it attaches to the main. Too many turns, too many other toilets to go through, things like that. But it's my opinion that every other home should really have a home inspection, including new or a sewer scope, including new builds. Uh, we, we do find debris in those lines. We found two by fours and gloves and, you know, disconnected lines that just weren't quite, you know, to the to the point of the, the main tap. Um, but new builds for sure. And and even if people think, well, my home isn't that old and somebody's been living in it for 10 years, uh, there's probably nothing wrong with it. And, and that's not necessarily true either, because over time you can get a belly or you can get something that slides just because of compaction underneath. And and so I, I think for the cost of a, of a sewer scope, it's a pretty good little insurance policy to make sure you don't have a very expensive, you know, repair coming up. So I would say, if it's a condo, let's talk about it, see what level it's on. Outside of that, I, I really think it's a good idea to get that scope done. Yeah, you're talking about a, an expense of, you know, right in the ballpark of 150 to 180 bucks in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, but we we're talking about, you know, saving potentially a ten to $12,000 issue. And a lot of people would honestly consider those deal-breaking issues because nobody wants to move in and spend that type of cash on their, you know, after they've just bought something. Um, and to get that figured out before you end up with a purchase and, and going through with it, um, you know, it's just, to me, that is, that would be a deal breaker issue for a lot yeah. of people. It'd be awfully tough to figure that out and find that out right after you bought something. Yeah, so. I, I did an inspection yesterday, really nice home, well-maintained, um, everything was going well, <clears throat> but we did the sewer scope and this home was, I think it was about 25 years old. And these people were the original owners. They, they did a great job with everything and they 
kept up with it. But when we did the sewer scope, there was about a 20 foot long belly where it was holding water and kind of creating a backup. And sounds like these folks unbeknowing, uh, they didn't know that they really had an issue because they just kept, they, they did the thing of keeping it clean. They had someone come in and clean it out every couple of years. So things didn't really start backing up. But um, I found out this morning that because of the length of that line, because it's going into a street that actually has um, lane markers in it, there you have to hire flaggers and whatnot. That expense was about $15,000 to get repaired. And it was like, just to your point, that sounds like a deal killer. They're working through it, but that's a pretty big expense that someone would never have known about if they wouldn't have done the scope. Well, and this is outside of what you do. You obviously don't do any of that type of work, but I mean, to have that work done during an escrow process, um, a lot of times some of these contractors will, um, you know, build, you can, you can, they can get paid through closing. Yeah. So, you know, versus, I mean, if you move in, you didn't spend that $150 to get that uh, sewer scope checked out. And now all of a sudden, you know, three weeks later, you, you find out that 25 years, they didn't have this problem, but you know, three weeks into the 26th year, they, you do have this problem and you're the new owner of it. You're looking at a fifteen thousand dollar bill, and that's going to be hard to swallow. Be, you, know, you were hoping to remodel your kitchen, and now you're not. Yeah, and you go from what potentially could be a, a, a two people living into a home to a family of five. A lot different, you know, process. A lot different issue going on with that sewer line. So that's when those things show up quicker. What about when you have a septic tank? Yeah, so septic tanks, you know, in Colorado, most counties would require that the seller have that septic tank itself uh, cleaned and inspected prior to the sale. But that normally does not cover the sewer line from the house to the tank. So, again, if it has not been done, then, yeah, we, we would check that out. Again, you know, it's one of those things in sewer scopes are in general are kind of this way. In most cases, they're good. But the one day it's not, you're going to want to know. Yeah, Exactly. Again, worth, you know, I mean, to me, it's worth, worth the, worth the uh, small yeah. expense. So something to consider. Um, what would you say about uh, radon? So I've, I've seen radon being tested for um, in virtually all kinds of homes. You know, sometimes you mentioned the condo when that might not be a good fit for a sewer scope. Um, if you're living in a third floor on a condo, maybe that's not a fit or, or, or is it? And, and where would you do a, where would you do a radon test versus not? Doing yeah. It? So you're exactly right, Matt. It, it kind of the same rules apply. Uh, radon tests, you know, the further off the ground you are with more air movement underneath your living space, the less likely that you have radon. Uh, we, we would always say that if you have a basement and it's going to be an area where you're going to be either living in, sleeping in, or basically finishing out, then you're going to want to do a radon test to make sure that the levels are low. Every home in Colorado, when I say home, single family home, anything but like a two or three story condo, every home has radon. And, and the question is how much? So we just want to make sure we understand what that looks like, uh, especially in a home that maybe you're going to finish out down the road. You're like, well, I'm not spending any time down there now, but you're going to want to know now for two reasons. You got to, you got to figure it out. Maybe it might be part of your purchasing uh, transaction or negotiation, as you mentioned, but also it would be nice to know or be able to have control of where that mitigation system goes. So when you finish out your basement, you're not, whoa, that thing's sitting in the middle of my living room, you know, so let's not do that. Yeah, that's that brings up a couple of interesting points. So one, I, I did have a condo, uh, somebody buy a condo and it was on the first floor. Um, they were, they, we explained the process, they were extra cautious and they said, let's get it chest, tested out. The condo was sitting on a slab and yet, and it was a thick slab and yet they still had some radon. Mm -hmm. So um, radon did pop up. There was another situation where um, uh, it was very early in my career. I saw somebody who, um, and I'm trying to even remember which side I was on. Uh, but there was a request for a radon installation and somebody decided uh, to be vindictive about it and they put it in a very ugly yeah. um and uh it was it was not you know that did not go over well so you might as well if you're going to have that as part of the negotiation you you want to make sure that uh, you have some control over where that yeah. might go chad when when people are buying homes this was very common well certainly during covid um you know but uh, it happens especially with people from out of town where you know things are moving fast, the market's moving fast. They've been watching the market in a certain area, but they can't be out here all the time. They decide to buy a home, and they've seen it virtually. Um, 
What about an inspection in that case, and how do you how do you address that yeah, for them? I think, I think obviously, you know, still do, do the inspection, kind of go through the motions as normal. We we do a pretty good job of creating a report that's comprehensive, but not too wordy and not too confusing. So the good thing about my particular report is one that I created with the help of realtors and buyers over the years. So it makes it very easy to understand where do I need to focus my time. That's going to be safety items first major defect second, and homeowner maintenance at the bottom. So we focus on those top two areas. And so when the buyer gets that report, one, our hope is, is it's fairly simple to understand where, where we want them to talk about or look at. But also, if somebody can't make it, we're more than willing to be available to have a conference call with them, talk through some of their concerns. I do like to get that report into their hands in most cases so they have some time to absorb it and go, all right, this looks important to me. And then if there's something they don't bring up that I think they should, then I will bring that up for them. Um, but yeah, we did that a lot where where there were times, obviously, at the beginning of COVID, where I think I was considered non-essential for about three hours. Um, I was doing inspections all alone for a long time, and uh, there were a lot of adjustments and things that we did. Sometimes people would do, you know, a FaceTime with me at the end to see things. That can be a little glitchy, which is, a, you know, sometimes tough to do. But we'll, we'll do what we need to do to get them comfortable. Yeah, use the technology. Yeah, now. sometimes we'll meet him out. You know, hey, we'll meet you outside after the home inspection's done, and we'll talk on the driveway if if they're if they're able to show up. We did that too. But if they're not in town, we'll be more than happy to make a phone call. What about uh, mom and dad? Should mom and dad come? <laughs> uh, you know, it's there's a new thing that I'm noticing in the meme world, if you will, on on social media that uh, is you know it's like buyer dads, buyer dads. Um, in other words, like home buyers, um, you know, they bring in their dads, and why wouldn't they? Your dad, you trust your dad, you love your dad, so get him involved, right? But um, buyer dads can be a little pain sometimes, um, and they're they're meaning well, right? And they're protecting their 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 son or daughter in the transaction. But uh, but anyway, um, with all due respect to moms and dads who are trying to be helpful, um, should should they come along? You know, I would say that it's okay for mom and dad to come along, but my preference would be is that they either one don't come or they come at the very end, and and that would be because moms and dads and people that have experience with purchasing and living in houses over the years have a lot of education and good information to share. Um, and add great questions to ask. But the trouble or the thing I find mostly is, is it kind of can be distracting to a home inspector if, for example, I'm in the kitchen running through my process and dad's outside and he wants to talk about the electrical box that pulls me away from things where I'm trying to educate a buyer and he's kind of doing his own thing. Um, so that can be distracting. And the key for that is, is every time we as a home inspector get pulled away from the process, there's an opportunity for something to get missed. And we we want not do that. So yeah, those, those can happen. I, I've had examples where both sets of parents were there and one's over here and one's over there and they're kind of taking us in multiple directions and ultimately we just had to say, okay, let's let's just have one uh, in repeating ourselves and those kind of things. Let's have one point of contact so that we're all hearing and listening and, and the questions can all be asked. But um, I know that they mean well and I know that they want to protect their kids. I did the same thing. I remember when my daughter bought a house. Boy, she lives in Utah and, and uh, that home inspector spent about two hours on the phone with me because I couldn't make it. So... <laughs> I'm one of those dads too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it just makes sense. I mean, any dad, uh, mom or dad is going to want to be involved and protect their, their children as best they can, especially the home, home purchase. But it makes sense, you know, to your point, there is a process to follow. And that's really what this is about. Um, what I always tell people, you know, they say, can I come to the inspection? Absolutely. I, yeah. I, would, you, I would say that buyers should go to their own inspection. Uh, hopefully you would agree totally with that. Agree. Yep. Um, but now what I also tell people, and I probably learned this from you, but I said, you know, Chad doesn't need help holding his flashlight or holding his ladder. Right? And the point is, um, let him run his process. And then you do actually have as part of your process, a review period at the end where it makes sense for, for all the questions to be asked. You got mom and dad over here, mom and dad over here. Now everyone can ask questions. The, the homeowner, home buyer can ask questions. And there's a process for that at the end. And then when they're in in person, Chad, you're obviously walking them back through the house, pointing out things that uh, that you saw during your inspection process. Yeah, that's right? correct. And and the process that that we have is 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 that we we start in the kitchen, get things rolling, so the dishwasher is done by the time we're done with the inspection, and then we 
do the exterior. And I, I, we, we try our best to explain this process right out of the gate to a buyer so that they know where we're going, what we're doing, how, you know, what do they need to do? Should they follow us or not? But we kind of talk about where we're going. And the, pre the reason why we have a process that, that takes us through a house and, and make notes of things in a certain way is because there are things that could happen upstairs in a bathroom that you would not see if you started from the bottom up. Water leaks, for example. If we start at the top and work our way down, we're running toilets, we'll see that as we go down in most cases. So there's a process to that. So taking us out of that process can be, can be you know, a little difficult sometimes. But yeah, it's... it's well, it's to the buyer's to the buyer's detriment. It also. could be for sure, um, and and you can imagine, yeah. I mean, nobody wants to be disturbed when you're when you're the expert and you're running your process and you're running your systems. Nobody wants to be disturbed or taken out of that, and because ultimately, you you know that the you may not be able to promise the same results. Yeah. You know, so that's you know, and like yeah, for example, if I'm it. if I'm working through the kitchen and I'm I'm making my notes and I get done there, there's a small little review that happens right then and there too before I go outside. So we're going to talk about the few things that I may have found in the kitchen and and be able to have that buyer get their eyes on it and ask questions that maybe I wasn't clear with or they're like, "Okay, what does that mean?" So we'll do a small review like we're done in the kitchen. This is what we're done. We're, we've done. We found, and then we go outside. We do the exterior. We stop at the electrical panel. We talk about the electrical panel. Do a review of what it is, and then we move on to the next one. So it's all by design to help get us as much information into the system as possible, and also get as much information out of us and to the buyer. Hey, thanks for staying tuned. If you like the content you have heard so far, please go ahead and subscribe. Now back to Matt and Chad. Chad, what about, um, you know, sometimes we do this and the snow falls, right? And sometimes there's multiple snowfalls. So I think about the roof and then sometimes obviously landscaping would be covered. Um, but what are the what are the challenges and how do you navigate those challenges when, when we have snowfall uh, and the snow laying on the ground? Or yeah, the I, I try to do the best I can as with our team to to get in front of that snowstorm, if at all possible, which means we try to get out there and at least get on the roof, get a drone up there to look and see what we can see ahead of the snowstorm. The good thing about Colorado is, you know, we have a lot of sun here and it's pretty intense and, and a lot of times it melts in the next couple of days. So we try to communicate with you, the realtors, the buyers, as to when we can get back out there to hopefully still meet your deadlines. I would say worst case scenario, we would look for a third party to, to maybe help us get out there and, and maybe they've got a little more availability. Um, always with snowstorms, things kind of tend to get backed up, not only for us, but roofing companies too. So we do our best to get in front of it. Yeah. And if we can't do that, then we're hopefully up there in the next couple of days after the snow. Well, and that part of that speaks to getting um, inspections scheduled during the inspection review process or the inspection objection is what you're working towards on a real estate contract. So not scheduling that on the day of your objection is helpful because if there are things that you have to go back and look at, and honestly, even when people schedule you and the weather's perfect, there might be a hiccup with access or something like that, right? Where, um, so the last thing we wanna do is, is have that scheduled right up against the deadline. Because if you do need to go back, like in the event where it's gonna snow today, for instance, and then you know in three days, we know that it should be clear enough to look at the, the roof, um, then you know you want to be able to have time for that. Yep. So, okay. Now, Chad, you have made the you've made the um, comment I think several times that you're like a, a general practitioner as yeah. a doctor, but you're gonna you're gonna make some general recommendations. You're gonna send somebody out to a knee specialist and a hip specialist and a heart specialist. What does that what does that well, look like? Well, so you? you know, for example, we're gonna go through and give that house a good physical, like we talked about. We're gonna look for items that that may need. You know, we talked about the safety, the major defect, and then the homeowner maintenance. Most of the homeowner maintenance stuff we're going to talk about and kind of give you some ideas on how to take care of things and preserve your, your investment in your home. But let's say, for example, we, we get down into the crawl space and we see some cracking or some movement going on that that is quite, you know, is, is out of what we would consider normal or for the build, the age of the house, it's not what we would typically see. We would send you to that specialist, an engineer, for example. So that would be, and the, sometimes people go, well, maybe I should get the engineer out there first and then have you come after. And I say, that's not a bad thing to do if you already feel or see movement. 
However, it might be best to try and give us an opportunity to look at something first and go, let's see if we can maybe save you that engineer and go, here's what you've got, this is why it's happening, or give them some information before they spend more money on something. Um, but yeah, we, we always try to send somebody to some to an engineer or a HVAC specialist, and a lot of times a roofing specialist because we have a lot of hail here. But yeah, we, we, we will do that when we find an opportunity or an issue that really should get another look. Well, and I think it's important. So I, I see a lot more inspectors um, that, that aren't you than I see of you because I, you help me out on the buy side. But when I have listings, I see all kinds of, I see these other people that the buyers schedule, yeah. right? And so we get a lot of reports that come through and I see a lot of inspectors um, pay a lot of attention to the roof in particular. And we have to get a roof special, specialist out there. And not that you, you, of course, obviously pay a lot of attention to that too. But what I, what I realized is that a lot of inspectors will, what I see is kind of a CYA, if you will, on the roof. Um, and then we very often need to get in a third party person to have that reviewed. So if you're, um, and, and so you've got to call out things that you see. It might just mean that you, there's further review that needs to happen. Yeah. That. Yep. I think with roofing, you know, the biggest thing is with roofs and, and, and we try to talk through this as well as if there are defects with the roof, it's best to get them fixed because of water leaks. We don't want that to happen. But also, let's say there's some hail damage or some of that granular, that grit loss on the roof. If that's happening, we want to get a roofer out there to get an idea of, hey, is this an insurance claim? Is this a warranty issue? You know, we don't want an insurance company to show up a couple of days before closing and go, hey, by the way, your roof is outside of a tolerance, so we can't cover the roof. It's happened and we're trying to avoid that surprise. And it's a fairly simple thing to do to get a roofer out there in the next few days to kind of back up or, or say, you know what, this is, this is gonna be somewhat normal for the age of that roof. So it's, it's a pretty big yeah. important component of the house. And we wanna make sure that, that we're doing our job of communicating well enough to say, I, we think it's good or let's get someone else to look at it. Yeah, well, and I think it's important to you know, that you're going to call things out. I think that's what people would hire you for ultimately is to call things out. And if that means we bring out a roofing inspector and, uh, or a roofing contractor and they say, hey, you know, I think that's within normal yeah. tolerance of what to expect with the roof this age, then we've covered our basis. And if not, then now we've got that sort of this extra insurance policy that Chad called it out. Chad flagged it as something to be concerned about. And now, you know, we have uh, somebody else, you know, kind of corroborate that and say, yeah, this is an issue that you yeah. need to take care of. Um, during your inspection negotiation or whatever. So very good. Um, Chad, just a couple other things. Are there any myths about um, home inspecting that need to be debunked or any any misperceptions that you would, now that you've got this amazing audience, <laughs> love to tell You know, I think about? that, that I, and I don't know if it's a myth or it's just maybe a conceptual understanding. I hear people say it a lot where they go, you know, I, I'm, I'm under contract, but because of the market, we can't ask for anything. So there's no inspection objection opportunity. And and so that means we don't need a home inspection. And I would thoroughly disagree with that. You you still you yeah. still want to protect your investment. You still want to know how to take care of it. And you want to know if there's any major things that to your point of the sewer line or maybe an HVAC system that's breaking down. You know, a lot of customers may have good education or good knowledge on how to take care of things, but Man, without having a physical of a, of a property that you're spending money on and it's not a cheap thing, it's probably one of the most you know important investments you'll make, you really should get a home inspection done. It, it's just a way for you to understand what you're buying and, and you know what that might mean for the future for you. So I, I would never ask or tell anyone to not do a home inspection even though they can't ask for something. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. And I would never uh, make that recommendation yeah. to anyone either. Um, there's, I think homeowners or home buyers need to understand that even if it's competitive and you need to, um, you know, kind of be careful about what you ask for, whatever, um, you know, and, and really make it favorable to a seller and appealing to a seller, you really have to still be, be careful to protect your, yourself during yeah. that process. Getting a home inspection again, um, you know, at, at the, the cost of what a, a home inspection is versus the the cost of if you didn't have one, you know, and you found some things that would be really devastating to, um, as a homeowner, 
um, that's just a bad way to start. Yeah. So we would never recommend. For it. sure, I think um, you know the one thing that that, that kind of goes along with that, you know, the cost of of a home inspection is just kind of based on the square footage and the type and all those things, but. I will tell you that even if it's a new build or even if it's a house that looks immaculate, we are going to find some things that is going to save you some money. And, and it's, so therefore it far offsets the cost of not doing it. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, Chad, as we kind of close here, um, what other types of inspections do you do? We obviously alluded to the pre drywall inspection. Um, you're doing a general home inspection for most home buyers. Uh, what are the other things? That yeah, so one for? of the other inspections that we can do is also the one-year warranty inspection. You know, right before the builder warranty is up, I actually was on the phone this morning with a client, and they've got three neighbors that want to do one, and and so they're all kind of coming up on their year. That's something that we do, and 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 like I was telling this customer on the phone, it's it's. Not only is it an education, again, about your house, but let's see what's happened. And is this kind of normal for the, the climate or, or what we should expect for a one-year-old home? But also, we're going to help you give you some vocabulary to speak to them in a way that gets those questions answered. Um, sometimes we'll go, hey, here's something going on with your house, and look over there at that house. It's different. Why, why do they do it there and not over here? And so we give them ways of pointing out or finding things Maybe so that they're not being told, oh, yeah, you know, we had somebody look at that and that's okay, even though I'm saying we need to have someone else look at it. So it's an education in, in how yeah. they can speak to their builder to hopefully get everything completed that needs to be done before that one year is up. Yeah, I think that's an absolutely great point. So uh, I don't know that enough people do that or even understand that that's something they can have done. Some people would say, well, you know, do I really want to spend an extra, you know, several hundred bucks to get that done? Again, you know, you'd be crazy not to, in my opinion. So when, and again, Chad speaking to, you've bought a new home, the builder is giving you one year to complete a punch list of, of items or things that you've racked up as um, issues, repair issues or repair items that need to be taken care of. After one year, they're going to turn you loose. They're going to say, hey, this house is yours. We're never coming back. We're never fixing anything else. So 10, 11 months into that process, bef you know, right before that uh, one year is due, you're going to call Chad. You're going to have him come take a look at your home. And then he's going to, as you just talked about, he's going to give you a list of things to, to tell the builder um, to be aware of. And that's your last chance to have the builder take care of anything in your brand new home. Um, so you might as well take advantage of that. And again, that's money well spent because chances are there's going to be repairs that the builder is going to have to do that are going to far exceed that. And you don't want to miss anything that yeah, should be on that Yeah, that's correct. List. And, you know, hopefully we find very little things, but we always offset the cost. It's pretty simple to do. Um, you know, sometimes we'll do a, another type of inspection would be a pre-listing inspection where a customer may want us to come in and kind of check things okay. out and give them a little bit of a punch list of things to take care of and get their home ready to sell. Um, those aren't nearly as common, but I do have also people that are like, hey, I've been in my house for 10 years and I'm not sure what I need to look for. So can you come in and tell me what I need to do to protect this thing? Because I might want to sell it in the next 10 years. And so we do those kind as well, where it's not, there's no buyer or seller situation. It's just a homeowner wanting to take care of what they have. Um, that is a really good point. And I, that was one that I'm actually not aware of. It makes sense for people to do that, but uh, yeah, why not? If you, if you just want to, um, it's your asset. Ultimately, you want to protect that asset. Make sure that you have that looked at and, and make sure that you're, you're taken care of. And Chad, what's the, the, the length of time where things tend to, um, is it 10, 10 years, 20 years where things kind of like the materials start to break down or if you start to see more repairs? I know, you know, like vinyl windows, for instance, they don't typically make it much longer right. than about 20 years before they start to fail. Mm -hmm. deals fail. Is there a, a timeline where things, even if you bought a brand new home 20 years ago, that things are going to... Well, I, I would say that in a brand new home, we just kind of walk through the timeline of it here. Normally, you're going to start to see some things happening or changing in terms of maintenance items that are going to come up on the exterior of the home, usually within that five-year cycle. Somewhere in there, you know, the paint isn't always the best quality sometimes, but the Colorado sun is very intense. So we have siding where it starts to paint, the paint starts to peel, caulking around windows, those things start to show up and that can allow water in and, and ultimately cause bigger issues. But af outside of that, that's gonna be a normal three to five year, check it out, make sure things are still good. Grading will show, start to show issues on a new build where it starts to go that flat we talked about, usually around the five year mark unless some landscaping has been done. Um, but outside of that, then we start to talk about utilities and hot water tanks and furnaces, you know, 12 to 15 years on a hot water tank, furnaces with good 
um, maintenance and AC units are about a 20 year lifetime. So things start to happen. But like I mentioned earlier, Matt, I think it's very important to listen to your house. And one of the things we always tell people when it's raining, go outside, walk around, make sure that water is moving away because you can catch something before it's too late. And I'll, I'll give you a funny little example. I had a new build up in reunion a long time ago. And one of my neighbors, um, he, he took down his downspout extension. So you have your gutter, your downspout and that five foot extension. He took that off and put on this alligator. So the water would come out the alligator's mouth into his yard. So it was a decorative piece, but it was only two <laughs> feet long. And so I would drive by his house and I would see that. And I'm like, well, I should probably talk to him about it one day. And lo and behold, he calls me up and says, hey, uh, I've got water in my crawl space. Can you come over and tell me what it is? And I'm like, well, you know, I really don't need to come over. <laughs> I can just tell you, you got to get rid of the right. alligator. So those kind of things are important to see. Or put it after the You're right, get a five-foot alligator. <laughs> So anyway, those things are where raining and when it's raining and people go out, it's raining or snowing, it's kind of a bad time to do a home inspection. I would disagree again in that case that when it's raining, yeah, there's some limitations on some things, but man, checking out the gutters and the grading is a, is a key component and that's the best time to do it. Well, I remember actually to your point, there was somebody in reunion that um, would tell me about things that would only happen. She, she's like, I think this is the best built home we've ever lived in in all of our years. She said, except for the, when it rains and when it rains sideways. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you're expecting the homes are built to shed rain um, that yeah. falls from the, the top, obviously, right? But she's like, we get some sideways winds, and all of a sudden, I'd have all these things, water coming in left and right. And so, you know, sometimes that, you know, that weather actually reveals. Well, yeah. And you issues, remember so. the bomb cyclone, people had snow in their attics. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, true. Um, well, awesome, Chad. Uh, I actually think I've learned. Um, maybe not, not only just a handful, but maybe 10 different things. Um, so I feel uh, feel fortunate that we've uh, had this conversation. Hope obviously the audience has uh, you know, been well educated. Um, again, this is part of our um, uh, homeowner education series. Um, if you, you own a home or you're looking to buy in this case, clearly um, you would involve Chad and his services. Um, we would love for you to do that, Chad. Um, we'll get your information, but um, how yeah, can we've got a you? couple of ways you can do it. You can go to our website, horizonhomeinspections.net. You can request some information there. It also tells our story. That's one way to do it. Another way is to Did you say Horizon Home Inspections. Yeah, net? and and then you yeah. can also we've got my cell phone number three zero three five two five five six two one. Um, obviously, we're very busy. We do Matt, just so you know, about forty inspections a week. So. Um, as a company. So sometimes I'm not able to get back right away. So a quick text message is good. So when I get stopped, I can call or I can get that to my admin team. We've got an admin team that works basically from eight in the morning until eight at night, seven days a week, handling calls and being available. Yeah. Scheduling. So that's, that's how we yep. typically like to do it. And as, as we get through the week, they do a lot of the coordination piece of it, but contacting us via the website or my cell phone is usually the initial start. And then we'll take it from there. Awesome. And you have how many people, um, how many other inspectors? Yeah, we have, we have three inspectors with the out. company. We're looking to bring on another one. And then I've got three or four folks that run radon machines around for us. And then I mentioned two admins. So we, we try to build a team that can support not only the quick turnarounds that you guys have, but also the hours that sometimes things happen. Most things, you know, when you go under contract, it's usually first thing Monday morning. And sometimes things happen at night. So we, we try to be available for that. Awesome. Fantastic, Chad. Like I said, I feel uh, like I, I feel like I've learned a bunch of things, and uh, uh, you're a great resource. You've been a great resource to my business, and uh, appreciate your friendship and your, um, you, you know, your uh, the business connection as well. And uh, so I, I feel, you know, I feel like people should also be able to learn from this, and and, and hopefully would look to call you, and um, you can be a resource to them as well. So um, yeah, thank you, man. Good to see you.